What we do to stop the use of uh, tax money to purchase and transfer Stewart County land to the Department of the Interior? I've researched this issue prior to being presented with the question, and frankly, I find the practice disturbing. Uh, we are regularly losing land from our tax rolls to organizations like the Civil War Trust, or now known as the American Battlefield Trust, which acquires land and then donates it to the National Park Service. Now, here's the thing. They are not just buying land with earthworks. They are buying single family residences and you can look out the window of this building and see one that they own. Also, it's interesting to note that they own another piece of land that has a cell phone tower on it and they rent these properties out. Ultimately, when they donate it to the National Park Service, it comes off of the tax rolls. Now, I have a family member that sold a piece of property to the Civil War Trust and it is his, is, pardon me, it is his right. However, I can't prevent myself from lamenting the lost tax revenue potentially over similar situations as this. Fort Donaldson is important. It was an important battle and had far reaching consequences and we should protect historical sites. However, we must do so while achieving a balance between protecting the past and providing for the future. And excessive lost revenue from the tax rolls jeopardizes the future of Stewart County. In addressing the source of these funds with which the American Battlefield Trust operates, their 2016 financial statement shows 32 million in revenue, over 10 million of that coming from federal and state grants. I strongly disagree with the practice of federal and state dollars being used to take land from our tax rolls, our tax money being used to limit our local tax revenues. With my family's experience in the land between the lakes and their experience with eminent domain as a private citizen and certainly as your next county mayor, I would not and cannot support a government land grab. However, these are voluntary private transactions between private entities. Thank you. We support the development of written bylaws and will you enforce adherence? I have to seek clarification on this question and, and it's written bylaws for the county commission is I believe what we're referring to. And I've spent several hours researching this topic. I've come through the County Technical Assistance Service, the Tennessee County Commissioners Association and various other websites. And I was in search of examples of bylaws employed by other counties and frankly, I, I couldn't find any. Now, there are three allowable structures of government, county government in Tennessee. The traditional structure, which is what we employ, consolidated city county government, which is what Montgomery County and Clarksville are currently exploring, and alternative forms of government, such as a county charter government, of which there are only two in the state of Tennessee. All three forms of government operate within a structure that is first defined by our Tennessee state constitution, and then further fleshed out by our Tennessee code annotated and private acts of the General Assembly. Even in an alternative government charter, the powers and operating rules of the county do not change. Now, the function of bylaws are to outline the structures, rules, and operations of an organization. The governing documents that I've previously mentioned already do that. The county commission has the ability to develop policies. A guiding rule is beneficial in the operation of an organization of this size, and I would support and encourage their pursuit of this matter. However, it is a matter they must choose to deal with. And this leads me to share with you that if elected, I do not desire to be chairman of the commission. I believe that in an effort to provide some separation of powers between the executive and legislative branches, thereby providing more transparency and accountability through greater checks and balances. Thank you. How will you deal with the conflict of interest caused by nepotism in the, in the Stewart County government? Nepotism rightfully carries a negative connotation. However, it's important to remember that according to the County Technical Assistance Service publication CTAS 1080, there is no direct prohibition of relatives in county offices. The closest that the state law comes to approaching this is dealing with state employees. There is no law on the state level dealing with county government. It does deal with transparency in hiring and conflicts of interest. Now, 
There can be conflicts of interest in hiring those related to you. I personally do not like the practice. And while the hiring of a relative may not be inappropriate, it is important to make sure that the best candidate is hired. One should always be mindful of the appearance when hiring a relative and be ready to clearly document, beyond a reasonable doubt, the qualifications of a candidate selected. However, the county mayor does not have it within his power to tell other elected officials who they may and may not hire. Ultimately, as mayor, I will work towards an environment of transparency so that you, the voter, can make the ultimate decision regarding the hiring practices of various offices through your choice of who you select to fill those offices. Thank you. What steps will you take to create a culture of transparency and accountability in our local government? Given my background in financial advising, I was taught and find it extremely beneficial to always set the proper expectations. And this is the heart of what transparency is. Government must deal with unpopular issues. And however, if government would set the proper expectations, then this would limit the opportunity for disappointment. Also, transparency offers a ray of light into the operations and procedures government employs. Light is a great disinfectant. Sometimes a situation can occur that is misunderstood by some, allowing the chance for conspiracy theories and witch hunts. This ultimately causes government to be inefficient in dealing with the side effects of a lack of transparency. This forum has already presented one idea that lends itself to solving the problem of transparency, the idea of bylaws. And as previously stated, I would support the adoption of procedural policies should the county commission seek to pursue them. If elected, I plan to offer periodic reports through audio, as I've already done in this campaign. If you're not familiar with these fireside chats that I've created, I encourage you to visit my Facebook page, Van Herndon for Stewart County Mayor, and there you will find where I've outlined what we've talked about here tonight in greater detail. It's also a great way to get in contact with me. And also, I shall offer a periodic report in the local paper and social media to reach as many of our citizens as possible. It is my goal to let you know what your government is doing to set the right expectations and to move Stewart County forward. Thank you. Can you give us a closing remark before we take questions? I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight, and I want to thank you for the time that you've taken to hear my vision and the other candidates' visions for Stewart County. The decision that lies ahead of you that you must make in the voting booth is an important one and certainly not an easy one. But the challenges that face Stewart County are significant. And those challenges demand to be dealt with. The longer we wait, the harder the task will be. However, Stewart County is home to some of the most caring, finest, and hardworking people that I have met. And there is nothing we can't do without perseverance, patience, and a plan. We must be accountable for every dollar spent. You run your homes under the idea that you shouldn't spend more than you bring in and there's no reason that you shouldn't hold government to the same standard. Also, we need to think down the road with the mindset that we are a community that welcomes businesses because businesses bring jobs and generate revenue, both of which Stewart County desperately needs. I'm Van Herndon and I appreciate your support. Okay, do we have any questions? Thank you so much for that question. I appreciate it. So what we have locally is within our county government, there's a couple of systems. Uh, it's very similar. We used to have what was called a 457 plan. Basically think of it as a government 401k. Now, mostly that has gone away because approximately, and forgive me, I believe it was about eight years ago, maybe less, the county adopted to participate within the Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System. So this is a state pension plan. Now the teachers, the educators, they participate in it already automatically. The county elected to have all other county employees participate in it as well. Now, so all county employees participate in this. They give up 5% of their pay and then the county matches, match is not an appropriate term, they provide an additional amount that is dictated by the state. Now, 
if the state's investments do well, then the amount required of the county by the state is less. If the state's investments in a given year don't do that well, <laughs> then they require more of the county. So that amount fluctuates. Now, I'm happy to say I'm not a fan given situations like New Jersey, Illinois, California. They all have pension plans in turmoil. They have overpromised and they are finding that they cannot deliver. However, Tennessee's pension plan is 98% funded and I feel comfortable. Now, I believe that we need to have additional savings. The state has a 401k plan and a 457 plan. I believe that we should promote the additional 457 plan to help with the, the pension plan. I do not feel uncomfortable in the funding of the pension plan. However, when a, an employee retires, they look at the average of the last five years of an employee's final compensation, and they provide 47.5% of that average final compensation. So basically, the day you retire, if you've not made other plans, you get a over 50% pay cut. So we do participate in a pension plan. Currently, Tennessee does well to fund it. It's still, we need to monitor that situation because uh, we at home are fairly well good with our money, not like some of our neighbors in other states but we still need to monitor that situation. But still, retirement should be a three-legged stool, social security, pension, and personal savings. We're not really doing anything for the personal savings part here. So, but thank you so much for your question. It is an important question, and thank you for asking it. If you read the story from TDEC about the wastewater treatment plant, the man from TDEC said at the steam plant is going to be the largest facility industrial wastewater complex like this east of the Mississippi River. So it sounds like to me they're planning on investing long term in internal sitting. This is a two part question pertaining to the government. I know, uh, you know, uh, Robbie, you had said something about the federal government taking care of roads going into entities. The National Cemetery up there last year, I did a story where there were 15,000 people a month that go into that cemetery, yet the town of Dover had to pay for paving the church. So with looking ahead to the steam plant and stuff like the wastewater complex that encompasses what you talked about, the water problems and everything else and what they're looking at doing and looking at what we're having to spend right now out of our county and city budget to fix roads for these tourists that are coming into Fort Donaldson, what are the plans on talking with them about helping us out immediately and how fast do you think that could happen? Danny, thank you for your question, and uh, I appreciate the work that you do over the standard, and I'm not pandering, by the way, I really do appreciate that. Um, we, uh, we share a common vision in that you're reporting and my, my feelings on how we've been treated by the federal government. There is definitely um, a disproportionate or inequitable uh, relationship there because they expect a lot of us, but they're willing to do very little for us. They've come in, they've taken our land, and then they have been so gracious as to tell us what we should be happy to accept from them. So, Danny, we, to address that problem, to address the problem of increased traffic in Cumberland City, to, to address the, the problem of increased traffic around the cemetery, um, all of these, you're exactly right in your reporting that this is a serious situation because they dictate what they pay for us. So basically, what we have on our hands is when it comes to these tax dollars and being having a, an equitable, uh, an equally equitable relationship, is it's going to be a schoolyard fight. Is basically what it is. And what I would recommend is that you know we go get our big brother. Um, you know we have connections. Um, you know I have a, a great relationship with uh, J D Reedy down in uh, Houston County. I've, I've developed relationships or fostering relationships with other people. Uh, we go and get them and we work our way up, we make those connections, and basically, I don't know if you remember the movie Shawshank Redemption, but when Andy Dufresne was trying to uh, uh, start a library in the prison, he wrote a letter every week and they finally sent him something to shut him up, and he said, well great, I'll double my efforts now. And so that's what we need to do, we need to, we need to capitalize on our connections, work our way up, be that squeaky wheel, and tell them that look, you have mistreated us, you have taken over half our land, and you expect us to pay for things that we simply cannot afford, it's time to write a check. And thank you again, Danny.